Right. Uh, our scripture lesson is taken from 1 Kings 18, beginning at verse 17. That's page 57. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of, my, of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, What you say is good. May God bless the reading uh, of his holy word, the word of the Lord. Lord, help me as I seek to expound this passage that it will be so profitable for us and so clear to us that we will understand what we must do in response to your holy word. For Jesus' sake, amen. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible, and yet it has some very troubling things in it as we read on. I'm struck, first of all, that there was an altar to the Lord. And, uh, and Elijah, we're told as we turn the page, he prepared uh, for them, uh, the alt repaired the, the altar of the Lord. And looking there on page 558, we see there in verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord which was in ruins. Now if we think back in all of this, in the study that we've been on now for many months on Old Testament characters, we discover that this was not appropriate. This was not appropriate. Where was the one and only place authorized to worship the Lord. It was Jerusalem. Because God put his name there, and God instructed King David, as he sought to prepare a place for the Lord permanently, to prepare everything so that David's son, Shlomo, we call him Solomon, that Solomon could build the temple for the Lord, and there the Lord would be worshipped. And it was the one and only appropriate place for God to be worshipped. Nevertheless, as you read through the history of Israel in the Old Testament, it's very obvious that people didn't follow God's commandments very clearly at all. And what I'm struck here is this. On Mount Carmel, which was a high place, and I've been on top of Mount Carmel, which overlooks the Mediterranean Sea, uh, would have been a place for worshipping the Lord imperfectly. Imperfectly. And I'm struck that even though it's imperfect, and even though it went contrary to the word of God, yet still God honors this place that had at one time been dedicated to the worship of the one true and living God. Because there's only one true and living God, and his name is Yahweh, as we've pointed out. And you miss that whole thing uh, if you don't understand that that. The Lord, all caps, is Yahweh. That's God's personal name. And there is no other God. There are other supernatural beings, but only one true God. And so I'm amazed here in a way that in this place of apostasy <clears throat> and at a site 
of an apostate form of worship, it was nevertheless a place of the worship of the one true God. And Elijah repairs that place. And that's I'm struck with. Now, I want you to see what happens here. As he, as he begins to, to call on the people of the... Look at verse, uh, 30, uh, verse 27 there on page 557, 558. Verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Is there a place for mocking other religions? Absolutely! But we need to be ha- careful how we do it. I would not go into Mecca. First of all, I could never go into Mecca. Mecca is off limits to anyone who is not an actual Muslim. And so is, is the second holiest site uh, in Saudi Arabia, and, and, and that's Medina, the city of the prophet. I would never be able to get there to start with. But suppose I did. Would it be right to mock the demonic god, Allah? Now, when I say that, that sounds strange, doesn't it? Because Allah is the name that translators of the Bible used when they translated the Bible into Arabic. They used the, the Arabic word Allah, which is a word for God, uh, to translate Yahweh, strangely enough. So it depends on the concept uh, and the content of what you mean by that. For example, when I stand in a prayer service and someone appeals to God, and that person is appealing to a God who doesn't exist, he's not praying to the same God I'm praying to. But we can show respect. The point I want to make here is that Elijah mocks the prophets of Baal. And look at what he says in verse 27. I really like it. Shout louder! He said, surely he's a God. And I want you to see the contrast. Baal is a god made in the image of man. That doesn't mean there's not a supernatural power behind it. But it means that Baal was a god made in the image of man. Think of uh, old Olympus towering tops. And uh, on old Olympus towering tops, let's see, that's how I memorized the 12 pair of cranial nerves. But there were all these foreign gods, the gods of Mount Olympus. And let me say that there is no connection whatsoever between Zeus and Yahweh. Zeus is the head of the Olympian pantheon. That means all of the gods. But if you discover, if you analyze the life of Zeus in Greek mythology, Zeus was a philandering, messing around with people, other people's wives, while he could have been our former president. And, uh, and so here is Zeus, a false god. And he's just like Human beings. He's like people are today, messing around. Uh, And he even did miracles in order to seduce people. One day he transformed himself into a swan to seduce somebody. So Zeus, there's no connection between the living and the true God and the gods on Mount Olympus. So we need to understand that. And uh, so again, he mocks them. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought. You know, like, hmm, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Hera has found out yet again. And so Zeus and his wife are similar to married couples today. Oh, no, what did she find out? And all of this stuff, so he's worried about it. Worried about it. So he's, uh, he's in deep thought, or maybe busy, or traveling. Think about it. See, that's the gods of the heathen. The gods of the heathen are gods made in the image of human beings. And they're just like us. They're simply human beings on steroids in the way that pagan people thought about their gods. And Elijah knows this. The the prophets of God in the Old Testament understood paganism very well. And then he goes on and uh, he says, maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. But there's something said here, interestingly, and it's this. He says there uh, in that last sentence about traveling, the Hebrew word there is sieg. It sounds just like 
what people used to say when they went, fell in love with a madman from Austria uh, in Germany. You know, they worshipped a painter, a corporal in World War I, uh, named Adolf Hitler, who wasn't even a German. But, but the power of demonic deception is so great that you can have the most brilliant nation in the entire world at that time, Germany, where the greatest scientists and all of these people were. It was the most liberal and progressive and wonderful nation in the entire world at that time before they decided to print money. And uh, with no standard behind it, the Weimar Republic went bankrupt. And so everybody is soon shouting, Sieg Heil! And this Hebrew word is Sieg, Sieg. And, and don't forget it, Sieg the Hebrew word sieg means to turn aside. But it's not like turning aside, to, I'm going to decide to walk over here and eat something or walk over here and get a drink of water. It's generally understood to turn aside to go to the toilet. And that's what, uh, that's what Elijah is mocking with. Maybe he said to go to the toilet. You know, wow, when you travel 400 miles round trip uh, on the Lord's Day, that's something you begin to think about. And so maybe, maybe, maybe Baal had to turn aside to go to the bathroom. That's what King Saul did. You remember the time that King Saul went into a cave to relieve himself? He went in there to use the bathroom. And so David's men are back in the back of the cave, and they said, now's your chance. And he goes up, and there's it. Saul had taken his robe off. Why? He had gone aside to go to the toilet. And so he goes up and he cuts a little piece of Saul's robe from him. And when Saul is finished, he takes his robe and he goes out. And then David comes out, making sure there's enough distance between him and Saul. And he said, he hails the king and he said, you know, the Lord put you in my hands. Here's your robe. I cut your robe, uh, but I could have taken your life. So seek, seek. Baal maybe has had to go to the bathroom. Well, think about it. I mean, what kind of nonsense do human beings believe about their gods? The God had to go to the bathroom. So he's mocking them. And uh, he goes on, and I want you to notice. Uh, so he says, he must be awakened. So look at verse 28, there on page 558. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Let me say something. You know, I always hesitate to say controversial things. When people begin to cut themselves, that's an indication of the presence of something demonic. I'm not saying it doesn't have a psychological explanation. It does. But there's also the evidence of the demonic. Why? Because demons love human blood. They do. And you see that throughout the Old Testament. They want blood. And they want these sacrifices. And look at the cruelty of it. Here are the priests of Baal. And they're slashing themselves until the blood is flowing. How exhausted these men must be. And what happens? Verse 29. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying. They know trouble's coming. They really did believe in Baal. They had seen supernatural evidence of Baal. This demonic spirit that was named Baal by the people, was a god of reproduction, of thunder and lightning, and they had seen responses from Baal when they offered sacrifices. It's not unlike, and I had wanted to preach a sermon on St. Patrick on March 17th, but God had other plans, and I was in the hospital. But it's not unlike what, what uh, St. Patrick did, who, by the way, was never, ever recognized by the papacy as a saint. You know why? Because what he preached was not the same as what you would have heard in the Vatican. But it's what happens. He challenges the Celtic priests and their gods. 
And you know what? God did miracles. He stopped the power of those Celtic priests. And that's exactly what's happening on Mount Carmel here in this story. And uh, listen to what happens. The second sentence, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Why? Because the prayers that Elijah prayed <clears throat> and other people who were praying for, them, for him who were there, where are they? They're not mentioned. Maybe they were too frightened to speak out, and that's what we basically get in the text. But they weren't too frightened to pray to God, Oh, Lord, I love you. Please help your prophet. He's gone out on an awful limb here. Please back him up, Lord. And as the Lord responded to those prayers, his holy angels bound the demonic spirits behind Baal worship. Verse 30, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come, near, come here to me. They came to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come. Your name shall be Israel. And with these, the stones he built an altar in the name of Yahweh, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. If you look down at the bottom, that is probably about 13 quarts. So uh, it, it, then he, he, uh, it says he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Verse 34. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Now look at verse 36. What an amazing verse. At the time of the sacrifice, this is at the time of the evening offering. And when would this have been? It would have been at exactly the same time in Jerusalem when God's official priests would have offered an offering in the temple built by Solomon. It's at that same time Elijah is connecting his offering with that. And God, in his own way, approves of that. And it's at the time of the evening offering sacrifice, Elijah stepped forward and prayed. And listen to this wonderful prayer. And I'm going to read it uh, at, with the original words there. O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Yahweh. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O Yahweh, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. This is about turning the hearts back to the Lord. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, Yahweh, He is God! Yahweh, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. Now, I want us to reflect on that for a moment. How does this apply to you and to me today? Do we have authority from God to go out to a, a Unitarian church and uh, pull the pastor out of the pulpit and kill him? Do we have the right to go to a Hindu place of worship in America today and pull the priests out who are offering, offering sacrifices to various Hindu gods? Do we have that authority, a right today? You know, I'm struck in the children's sermon as, as little Mabel Cook was up here, I made a reference to the catechism which cost, talks about people having authority according to their place and calling. What is your place and your calling? We do not live in a theocracy. We are not ancient Israel. In fact, no entity on the earth today corresponds exactly to ancient Israel. Not the modern Israeli state, which is basically founded by secular people. 
and is a secular attempt, although there are people who do hold to the religion of the rabbis, like the Pharisees. They are the Hasidic Jews, and they live there too. But many Hasidic Jews refuse to go to Israel. Why? Because modern Israel has not been led by the Messiah. And so you discover a division within Judaism over the modern Israeli state with certain Hasidic Jews, certain ultra-Orthodox Jews, refusing to go there, believing that it's under God's curse because the Messiah has not come, and until the Messiah comes, it's not under His blessing. I'm just throwing that out. The point I want to make is this. Modern Israel and ancient Israel are two different entities. Nor is this about the United States, of all the absurd things. You know, there's, a, there's an interesting cult, and there was a man who used to have a radio broadcast named Herbert W. Armstrong, The World Tomorrow. And he adopted a lunatic uh, theology called British Israelism. And in British Israelism, they, they took the Hebrew word barit, which means covenant, and the Hebrew word for man, ish, and they, and, and they said, this refers to the British people. So therefore, you and I, who are descended from those Anglo-Saxons who settled in, in England and came and colonized much of the world, we're the, we're, the, we're the men of the covenant. We are that today. And that's just nonsense, just utter poppycock. And, uh, and so it certainly doesn't apply to the United States. To whom does this passage apply in a particular, poignant way to the church of the living God. But there's something we have to say about the church of the living God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. None of us, certainly none of us as a private citizen, has the right to go and to destroy these monuments of idolatry that have always been throughout the world, wherever God's people have ever been. It wasn't long, I think, back to the pilgrims uh, who landed at Plymouth Rock and how proud my father was that the uh, first lieutenant governor of that colony was our ancestor. And then I've discovered, as I've said before, that he was crook, and he stole all the pilgrims' money and ran off with it, Isaac Allerton. But even there... How long, how long do things last before they're corrupted by idolatry and wickedness and sin? You know, and, I, and I look at what happened. The Puritans who settled in the 1630s had a few ancestors there too. And uh, how long did they hold on to the truth of God as they came? And in, if you look back to Mother England, how long did the, the Puritans last? You know what happened to the Puritans in England? They became the Unitarians. They denied the Holy Trinity, which all true Christians confess. That's why I like to use the Nicene Creed. All true con Christians confess in one God who lives eternally in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Unitarianism took over England among the Puritans and in the New World. And not only did they deny the uh, Trinity, but they denied the blood atonement of Christ. They denied doctrine after doctrine after doctrine because I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, and it's this. We cannot protect the truth any way but with the sword. What sword am I talking about? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And it means that in every generation we have to stand firm in the words of Jesus' half-brother Jude. We have to contend earnestly for the faith which has been once for all delivered to the saints. The book! The book is our authority. This is the Word of God. This is the sword of the Spirit. That's the sword we must wield. And in modern America, the problem with America, why America is today under a curse from having a rematch of two men, neither of whom would I want to be uh, dating my daughter, uh, why we're in a rematch with these two men and nobody seems to think about a third man, they want to make sure he doesn't even get noticed and refuse to give him a, a protection of the Secret Service, of all things. 
Why are we in this situation? You want me to tell you why America's in the situation it's in? It's the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The problem with America is the problem of the church. And the problem with the church lies in this one thing. The book, the Bible, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. God has given to the church the authority to wield the sword of the Spirit. The weapons of our warfare, said St. Paul uh, to the Corinthians in his second letter, are not carnal. We're not pulling out a sword out of a sheath or a 357 magnum out of my closet or something else. We are pulling out the unsheathed Word of God, the Bible, the book. The problem with America, the reason we have two wicked, evil, ungodly men who are contending to be president is because America has been judged by Almighty God because He's judging the church of the living God. You really believe that, Bob? I really believe it. Do you want to see America's problems resolved? It starts at the church. And instead of pointing our fingers down the street or over there, let's start here. Let's ask ourselves as we come today to the end of this service, Lord, what do you want to deal with in my life? What do you want to deal with in my life? Am I a silent worshiper of the one true God and never open my mouth as all of the people that were standing there on Mount Carmel were? Am I that way? Or am I willing, Lord, to take a stand for you and stand up for what the Bible says? Do it winsomely, doing it, doing it lovingly. I think of um, relatives of ours whose lifestyle is radically different than the Word of God. Am I willing to talk to them openly about what Scripture says, but to do so in a gentle, in a loving, in a winsome way? And I can say of our relatives whose lifestyles differs radically from the Bible. They know that Sandy and I love them. One of our relatives even writes lesbian erotic science fiction. You're kidding. I didn't know there was such a thing. There is. But you know what? She and her wife contact Sandy and me to pray for them. Why? Because they know we love them. Do we love people enough to tell them the truth? I read an article in Christianity Today this past week about a Presbyterian minister who loved Richard Nixon. And he loved him enough to tell him the truth privately and from the pulpit over and over again. Richard Nixon attended that man's church after he resigned from the presidency. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. How sad it is that a Donald Trump or a Joe Biden, are surrounded by sycophantic people who never tell them the truth. The warning that both men need to hear is this, and it's the warning I give to everyone who's hearing this sermon on the internet, as well as here. Unless you repent and cast yourself on God's mercy in Christ, you will perish. What does it mean in the Bible to perish? It means to be cut off from God forever in a place that Jesus described as the outer darkness, as the place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and pain, in a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm never dies. That's what Jesus said. So I say, how does this apply to you and me today? We're in a nation that is certainly turned aside from the Lord and certainly has embraced Baal, and Ashereth under various forms. What's the major way that we do that? Sandy and I watched a movie that we had first seen when we were in high school called It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World. And you know what that movie is all about? It's the number one God in most people's lives. It's the number one God in modern America. And that God is what? More money! That's Baal. Are you willing to sacrifice your wealth for the sake of the kingdom of God? Are you willing to sacrifice your reputation for the sake of the kingdom of God? Are you willing to be mocked by the haters of God who control much of our public media and much of the public square? Are you willing to stand for the truth, stand winsomely 
Stand humbly. Stand gently. Stand with pleading rather than finger pointing. But stand for the truth and wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Because I say to you, brothers and sisters, that is the only hope of America. I do not think this nation is going to last a lot longer unless God sends revival. I believe that the forces of civil war are at the gates. And I believe that foreign powers are manipulating us by means of hacking and the internet, stirring up strife and hatred so that people can't even talk straight to their neighbors. You know, Sandy and I know our neighbors, and they know us. And we don't ever get into foolish, vain arguments over this or that. Our neighbors probably on all kinds of issues differ radically from us. But they know that we pray for them. And we know, they know that we love them. And listen, I'm not bragging, but I'm encouraging you to follow our example. Get to know your neighbors. Share the love of Jesus with them. You know, it doesn't take a person, a, a theological education to do one simple thing. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To pray. So I have trouble praying out loud. It's okay. You could do this. You could say to your neighbor, is there something I could pray for uh, about you? You know, the vast majority of people, I would say in my experience with people, over the years since I became a Christian on September 4th, 1964, the vast majority of people will say yes. And many people will open up and share. And as God enables you to hear their request, and you pray silently for them, if you're not comfortable praying out loud, maybe God will eventually enable you to pray out loud and simply lift that request up to God. You can do that. You don't have to have mastered systematic theology. You don't have to know all of the Bible. You remember the man who was born blind and Jesus healed him? And he's asked by the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin uh, and said, acknowledge this man as a sinner. And he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. A simple testimony. Praying for others. Loving people enough to pray for them. You know, that is so gentle. That is so non-confrontational. I close with this one quick story. Uh, back in 1982, uh, through a weird series of circumstances, I was in Washington, D.C. for over a week. I'd been sent up there by uh, an organization. And um, I had the better part of a week to kill. And so I decided to call on my representative. Back then, Louisiana had eight U.S. representatives. And my representative was a very highly progressive uh, Democrat. And I went to see him. I made an appointment. And on the appointed day, I went into his office. And he said, I've, I've only got a couple of minutes. And so I said, Representative Long, I said, I, I want to speak to you that you would be pro-life and anti-abortion. And he said, well, Bob, let me tell you why I'm, I'm not that way. Uh, and I thanked him for telling me. And then I did something. And it's so strange. It's so weird. It's so beyond belief. I said, Representative Long, could I pray for you? And he said, go ahead, Bob. And so I took his hand. I like to touch people when I pray. I took his hand and I began to pray for him earnestly. What I didn't know were the things that were on in his body at that time. He was so moved that when we finished praying, he had tears welling up in his eyes. And you know what he did? The man had had only a, a short time to hear me when I spoke to him on an issue. So Bob, come with me. And he took me with him, and I met all of the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives. Texas owned Jim Wright. That man had the bushiest eyebrows I've ever seen in my life. And he loved to sell books because they made a lot of money. And uh, I, I met all these people, Tip O'Neill, all these people. I met with them. And then he took me into the gallery to watch. And he sat there and explained everything that was going on. And he said, now, Bob, I've got to leave to go vote, but I'll come right back. You stay here. Now, what does that tell you? You know what that tells me? 
that when you move in the sphere of your own authority and anointing, you're going to change people's lives. God will use you. God touched that man's life. He profoundly moved in that man's life. I'm not saying that he ever changed his views on how to apply pro-life. But I am saying this. I believe that when he died a short time later, that he went to be with Jesus. And you know when I think of the whole thing? Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and I think of eternity? What matters most? What matters most? What can a person give in exchange for her soul, his soul? Listen, what matters most is reaching lost people with the gospel. And how do you do it? By beating them over the head with the Bible or by gently, sweetly, and humbly praying for them privately and then when you have opportunity out loud. Would you do that? We can change America. Wielding the sword of the Spirit and prayer. May we pray. Lord, bless this message. We pray for all of us here that we may be concerned because our nation has been overrun with those who worship Baal. Lord, our nation has been overrun by those who love money. Just the madness, Lord, in this old comedy uh, from uh, about 60 years ago. Lord, wow, the insanity that money drives people. Lord, would you free us from the worship of Baal in our own lives, from the worship of money, of mammon? And would you give us to love the Lord Jesus Christ? For Jesus' sake, amen. Our closing hymn is number 508, Love Lifted.